To say that it is deeply personal, I think, would be an understatement to you. You know the astronauts. You've been with SpaceX before. Walk us through the significance of what tomorrow means. Yeah, boy, you know, this is something I've been involved with for a long time. So, yeah, it is kind of emotional right now. But, uh, but tomorrow means a lot. And it means a lot uh, for the reasons you highlighted in that piece. Um, it, it's first and foremost the return of the ability of the United States and NASA to launch our astronauts to the International Space Station to Earth orbit on our own vehicles. And that's something we haven't been able to do for the past nine years. But it's also the beginning of a whole new age, a whole golden age, I believe, of commercial space flight. Uh, because one of the things that's different now is the fact that uh, NASA does not own that Falcon 9 and Dragon, SpaceX does. And so after this mission's over, we can use the same rocket, the same spacecraft to fly non-NASA missions and take ordinary citizens up into space. So I think it's opening up all kinds of new possibilities. And what does this mean specifically for SpaceX? We were noting that you have been at that company up until 2018. You oversaw some of the operations of the Dragon spacecraft. How does this shift how we view SpaceX as a company? Well, you know, it's, it's taking on increasing levels of, of uh, importance and responsibility as we've gone to launching the Falcon 1 to the, the Falcon 9 and then the Falcon Heavy uh, taking on eventually national security missions and then launching, uh, you know, communication satellites to geostationary orbit. Uh, so we've, we've kind of done this in the building block approach. And this is not the last building block. And that's the important thing to realize is that, yes, this is very important. It's a huge milestone for NASA, for the country. It's a huge milestone for our company, SpaceX. But it's just the next milestone. And there'll be milestones after this. And uh, SpaceX is already working on a much bigger rocket. Uh, the Starship, and, and, and so there's a lot of exciting things still yet to come. And some of those future milestones I think that you're alluding to could be commercial spacecraft. How realistic is that in the coming years, in the coming decades? It's extremely realistic. Look, we're going to fly this mission hopefully tomorrow if these uh, thunderstorms don't uh, shut us down. Uh, and then after that, there's going to be another mission of NASA astronauts up to the space station. But the next planned mission of the of the of the Crew Dragon is to fly private citizens. Uh, in 2021, SpaceX has agreements to fly into, uh, private citizens on on the rocket. So that's the be that's the beginning of these uh, commercial flights. And it's not just SpaceX; it's also Blue Origin that has a, a rocket called New Shepard, and and Virgin Galactic that has Spaceship Two. And these companies are also selling tickets. Or Virgin is right now. Uh, to go on suborbital flights. So this era of commercial space and space tourism uh, is, is literally right around the corner. Has this changed at all, the collaboration between the public and the private sector with NASA and SpaceX coming together? You previously had Boeing get involved. What does this mean about these public-private partnerships and the collaboration between the two, these new ventures that you're seeing? Yeah, so this is a different model than NASA has used in the past. I mean, NASA, NASA always used private companies to build their vehicles. NASA didn't have a factory that built the Saturn V or the space shuttle. It was companies like North American, Rockwell, and uh, even like the Chrysler Corporation built part of the Saturn rocket. So uh, the difference is the relationship between the government and the private sector. And now it's much more of an e equal relationship, a partnership, whereas in the past, it was the government in charge and, and, the, and, and the ability of the private company to own the intellectual property and to own the vehicles and operate the vehicles, that is very different from what's been done in the past. So it does, uh, it, 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 it does open up new possibilities and it's something that has been very effective and as you mentioned in your piece, has already in this particular program saved the taxpayer potentially 20 or $30 billion. So, so it's, it's, you know, so far it's, it's working great. I want to get back to um, the specifics about tomorrow. You know the astronauts on a personal level. What will be some of their biggest challenges? When can you sort of breathe out that sigh of relief when you know that we're in the all clear? Um, when they're back on Earth and we're in a, in a bar and, and the pandemic is over and we're having a beer. <laughs> I think that's when I really can breathe the sigh of relief. Uh, yeah, yeah. Look, it's uh, it's always risky when you're when you're blasting off on a rocket. The physics are very unforgiving. It's a tremendous amount of energy that's been converted from chemical energy to kinetic energy and into heat, and, and so it, it's it's um it, it's not the safest way you should spend uh, your Wednesday. But um, I think we've done everything we possibly can to make this safe, and I'm confident. And one of the things that is the same as it always has been at NASA 
is the end stage, the certification, the, 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 um, the, the proof and the verification, the validation that all of NASA's requirements are met and that it's safe to go fly. It's the same process NASA's always used. It's extremely rigorous. I think we're as, we're as ready as we can be to go fly.